The following is a presentation of Apologetics Press. Welcome to the series, Evolution is Religion, Not Science. The goal of this series could perhaps be best summarized by 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. In this particular area, when we talk to people about evolution, talk to them about the theory of evolution, uh, their beliefs on where they came from, their beliefs on the origin of the universe, uh, this is a very important area to be able to, to give a defense to Christianity, be able to defend Christianity, to be able to encourage people to become Christians. And so, again, uh, welcome to the series, and we will be providing a lot of information that will hopefully be helpful uh, when you engage in those types of conversations. A few main points that we'll be making throughout this series. First, uh, again, along the lines of evolution being religion, not science, despite widespread claims to the contrary, molecules to man evolution. And this means the belief that somehow simple chemicals uh, got together, they formed simple life, and then that simple life turned into progressively more complicated life, eventually turned into man. Uh, that has nothing to do with true science and is merely a fa popular false religion of the 21st century. Uh, another important point is that true science is actually the enemy of the evolutionists, and scientific progress on topics such as spontaneous generation and information in the genome show the theory of evolution to be scientifically absurd. So not just uh, non-scientific, but really absurd from a, a scientific standpoint. Uh, we're going to cover some ambiguous arguments that are used to promote evolution. These include homologous structures, a lot of the ways arguments associated with fossils are used by evolutionists. Uh, again, there are uh, arguments that are widespread throughout the popular media, but they really have no scientific relevance, no real relevance to the area. Uh, also going to show that true science and data show the weakness of atheistic theories related to age. One of the areas where evolutionists will really attack Bible believers is on the age issue because a, a straightforward reading of the Bible indicates that the, God created the universe a few thousand years ago and they will uh, try to claim that no we've proven with contemporary science that the universe is maybe 13.7 billion years old that maybe the earth formed four and a half billion years old and we're going to show the assumptions behind those theories and just the extreme weakness of those theories but uh, in that context, we're also going to talk about no matter how good our intentions, we must resist the temptation to distort scripture to accommodate contemporary theories or beliefs. And this is another key point uh, in the discuss discussing evolution, discussing any aspect of that theory. A lot of times uh, we might be talking with a person and we might feel that, well, they're just, they're just stumbling on this one point. And maybe if I uh, distort scripture a little or I pretend the Bible said something that it really didn't say, uh, that maybe I can get them to listen to me more. And that God tells us, he warns us not to distort scripture. And it's very important that we are willing to defend the Bible, defend a, a straightforward reading of the Bible. And so I want to start out, we'll go back to, uh, uh, just to give a brief example of what we're talking about. We'll, we'll start out talking about spontaneous generation. And again, uh, all of the areas of evolution, uh, a lot of times the, the conversation will start out with the evolutionists uh, really uh, almost being condescending, acting like anyone that has chosen to put their faith in the Bible, that has put their faith in God, you know, that's just maybe a blind faith or it's not based on the facts. And, and they believing in evolution, that's something that has been proven scientifically and that they have all of the facts on their side. And so a lot of times it's good to just, just ask them some questions. And uh, the questions related to spontaneous generation can be very effective. And so a question we could ask is, is it scientific to teach that something happens spontaneously, life arising from non-life, that we've been unable to duplicate given our best laboratories, our smartest scientists, and virtually unlimited financial resources? Now that's a, a fairly easy question to say, but to get someone really thinking about it, we might want to give them a few examples. For, for example, if I have this remote, you know, it's fairly sophisticated. They're not overly expensive anymore, but it's a, a fairly sophisticated device. And I could say, well, is it scientifically or scientific, is it credible for me to say, well, this, maybe this remote just made itself. I mean, if I, if I was debating where did this remote come from and someone told me, I may have bought it from someone at a garage sale and they charged me uh, you know, $10 for it, and I'm trying to think of if I got a good deal or not, I could ask myself, well, boy, was there any design or any engineering that went into this remote or did it just make itself? Because you know, if this, the guy uh, you know, just found these remotes laying around in his backyard and he's selling them for 10 bucks, I'd think, boy, I'm not getting a very good deal here. And so, uh, you know, so I would look at it. Well, it wouldn't take very long to figure out that you know, this 
remote really could not have just randomly occurred. It's, it had to be a lot more than just you know, a lightning strike or a tornado or you know, something uh, causing this remote to form. There's, there's a lot of detail here. So I'd be pretty comfortable that it's, you know, there was some science or some engineering used to make this particular remote. Uh, I can look at cars. Uh, I can look at airplanes. I can look at space shuttles. I can make, uh, I can make you know, similar observations or uh, you know, pose similar questions related to those. In every case, uh, you know, I can say, uh, yeah, I'm confident that cars had to be designed and built by someone, airplanes, space shuttles, and, and really if I was to say that, oh, maybe space shuttles just make themselves, you know, maybe NASA just pockets that, that budget they have and, and rather than having to go out and make things, they just, you know, find them laying around out in the, out in the jungle someplace. And, you know, of course, it'd be absurd to think that, but, you know, it's you know, possibly a theory that someone could have. Uh, but the point is, is that the simplest life, the simplest bacteria is vastly more complicated than any of those. A simplest life, simplest bacteria, vastly more complicated than a car or an airplane or a space shuttle. And so to say that simple life just somehow made itself is, is more scientifically absurd than saying a car or an airplane or a space shuttle could just make itself. And again, just to drive that home, you know, people can make, we can make cars, we can make airplanes, we can make shuttles. They're expensive, they're hard to do. Uh, we've come nowhere close to making life from non-life. Spent hundreds of billions of dollars are some of our smartest scientists work in that field, labs that are just unimaginably sophisticated. No one has come anywhere close to making life from non-life. We talk about uh, uh, tremendous advances in the, in the field of biology, and there have been tremendous advances in the field of biology. One of the uh, advances that made headlines around the world was cloning. We we're actually able to take uh, a DNA, take a nucleus, take the genetic information from one cell and, and cut it out of that cell and very carefully transfer it over to another cell and reimplant it in that cell without introducing so many errors that it killed the, the new cell. And that was hailed as a tremendous scientific achievement and, and it really was. Uh, but when we think about what we did, all we did was we transferred uh, life, you know, uh, uh, part of a living organism that was already in existence, that had already been created, and all we did was just transfer that from one cell to another. Nowhere, nowhere close to, to making life from non-life. And so, again, and just in this one area, uh, don't have to ask a person what they believe, because a lot of times in a belief system, as we'll look at later on, many famous evolutionists, they'd actually calculate the odds. They would show odds that uh, are, would to them having a mathematical training, having a scientific training, odds that would instantly show their belief was impossible, their belief in uh, evolution could not be true. Uh, some of them stopped being evolutionists, but someone, some of them still clung to their faith. They clung to their faith in evolution. So uh, we don't have to ask where they believe, whether they, or not they believe life could just make itself, but we just have to ask, is it scientific to teach that? I mean, is that really science? Uh, if, you're, if an evolutionist is claiming they're scientific, claiming they have data on their side, you just need to ask them, is that really scientific or is that just what they happen to believe, happens to be where they've chosen to put their faith? And uh, questions like these, uh, any person uh, that's willing to be objective, willing to uh, think about it even, even a, to a small degree, will realize that, you know, in this case, uh, evolution not only has nothing to do with science, but again, science has shown it to be completely absurd. Uh, and that's, again, science that's advanced over the past uh, several centuries to the point where we know the complexity of life. We know that there is no such thing as simple life, and we know that it could not just spontaneously arise. And so uh, a question could be, well, how could you know, with this, just even on that fundamental level where it's very straightforward to show that evolution is, a, again, a non-scientific theory, how can, it, how can it be taking route? How, how can it somehow be portrayed as science in our society? Well, I think one of the answers to that is a lot of times evolutionists uh, confuse atheism with science, and they encourage society to do the same. And possibly a, a very good quote related to this is from Dr. Richard Lewinton, a very, again, a very intelligent, educated man, also a very staunch evolutionist. And here's his quote uh, related to uh, talking about evolution. But interesting, he starts out, he says, we take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of his constructs. Well, there is nothing absurd about science. And so, and there is no patent absurdity about constructs associated with science. True science is observable, it's testable, it's repeatable. I can go into the lab, I can perform experiments, I can test theories. There is absolutely nothing absurd about true science. So that opening statement should, should raise a flag. It should tell us that there's something up here. Uh, and then, then he goes on, he talks about, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories. 
Well, where I work, there is absolutely no tolerance for unsubstantiated just so stories. If there's an anomaly, if there's an observation, uh, it is delved into, it is uh, investigated to an excruciating degree. There is no uh, allowance or tolerance, again, for an unsubstantiated just so story. And so, again, as we, as we read through this quote, what we see, he's really not talking about science. What he's talking about is atheism. If we replace the uh, word science with atheism, we can see right away the quote actually makes a lot more sense. If we said we take the side of atheism in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the atheistic community for unsubstantiated just so stories. Well, again, now all of a sudden that quote is making sense. And so, uh, so again, what we can see is there's been this blurring uh, with any false religion that kind of becomes dominant, which is really what has happened with evolution. I uh, see this blurring of terms or these uh, claims that, that really aren't accurate or aren't uh, using the language possibly and the, or using the language properly. And that's what we're seeing here again, where evolutionists uh, confusing atheism with science. Uh, go ahead and read the rest of the quote because again, there's some telling things in the quote. It says, uh, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism, again, nothing uh, scientific there. To his credit, he does mention, it is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated, Moreover, this material is an absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. And so again, when he talks about a commitment to materialism, that has nothing to do with science. Again, to his credit, he at least uh, subconsciously admits that. It has nothing to do with science. It has everything to do with atheism. And so this commitment to materialism, uh, this confusion of atheism with science is really why uh, one of the reasons uh, people will now view evolution as somehow being a scientific theory, uh, whereas again, it is really just a contemporary false religion. Again, talking about true science, uh, if I was to perform, say, gravity experiments using this remote, uh, give an idea, just you know, simple true science, I could drop the remote from different heights, I could see how long it took to hit my hand, uh, I could drop uh, maybe a chair or drop something else, see how long it took to fall, I could develop what the uh, gravitational acceleration constant is, uh, all kinds of things gained from true science, nothing absurd about that. Again, many people refer to conjectures related to origins as origin science, but again, these conjectures typically completely unrelated to operational science. And again, advances in true operational science have repeatedly shown the extreme weakness of false theories of origins. We use uh, the example of spontaneous generation, again, advances in our understanding of, of life and how complex it is. Uh, we use those advances to, again, show true science being the enemy of the evolutionists. And again, throughout the series, we'll talk about numerous other examples. I uh, want to uh, uh, talk now about what God tells us, or some of the verses, some of the scripture that related to this subject that we find in the Bible. Uh, Again, uh, very important that we root all of our thinking in the Bible, that we base all of our thinking on God's word. God warns us that false teachings and false religions will arise, and this includes atheism and the theory of evolution. If I go to 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 4, it says, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to miss. And so again, uh, God tells us that time will come when they will, uh, wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. And what we see today is a lot of people, uh, they don't want to be answerable to God. They don't want uh, to have a set of guidelines for their life. Now, of course, uh, uh, they think that'll make them happy. In reality, we know it, it does not make them happy, but that's from a Christian perspective. From their perspective, they just see uh, being a Christian as, as having to uh, be obedient, and if they do not want to uh, uh, follow God or obey uh, God's will for their lives, <clears throat> they want to reject Christianity. A key to being able to reject Christianity would be to, to be able to put their faith in some other uh, way that they came about, some other way of origins. And so a popular false religion instantly becomes evolution that just says basically that they created themselves, that God didn't create them, that just through a series of random events over billions of years, they somehow created themselves. At that point, they aren't answerable to anyone. And so that's uh, uh, possibly one of the desires or one of the reasons uh, people, uh, some people at least, will uh, uh, choose to put their faith in, in this particular theory. Uh, God warns us that even some professed Bible believers will promote false teachings. Now, this one's, uh, again, a little uh, 
uh, disturbing, frankly. Uh, but Acts 20, 20 through 30 says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. From among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. And sure enough, if we go out on the internet or we look out in the literature, uh, there are professed Bible believers, people that claim they believe the Bible, that develop these multi-page theories or, or even uh, whole books uh, they propose kind of these hybrid theories. They take a little bit from the Bible. They take a little bit from the world. And they try to mix and match and come up with, well, here's what really happened. Here's, uh, you know, here's how the universe was really created. Here's how. And, and typically, again, it's a mix between what God tells us in the Bible and what uh, atheists will tell us uh, regarding things like the theory of evolution or the age of the universe. And, and again, just these, uh, you know, well, air, you know, false but uh, highly developed theories, highly developed alternatives to a straightforward reading of the book of Genesis. And we, and we see that. But again, God warned us that that would happen. Uh, 1 Timothy 6, 20 through 21 warns us also that some Christians will be led astray by this. And so again, these uh, false teachings, kind of these mixed theologies, half Bible, half worldly, uh, that not only uh, in some cases will Bible believers promote them, but just Christians in general, whether that theory was put forth by an atheist or uh, someone claiming to be a Bible believer, that many Christians will be led astray. If I read uh, 1 Timothy 6, 20 through 21, it says, O Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding worldly and empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and thus gone astray from the faith. Grace be with you. Again, talks about uh, opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge. And again, that's what we see uh, in a lot of these series. People will say, well, I know the Bible says this, but I need to change this word and distort that word and take this word out of context and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to try to match it what they think is knowledge, but what God tells us will be falsely called knowledge. Uh, must resi resist the temptation to distort Scripture even if we think our motives are good. Again, uh, as we mentioned, a lot of times people, when they're distorting Scripture, they think that by distorting Scripture, they might actually help a person become a Christian or uh, maybe help strengthen someone's faith. In the long run, again, that does not work, and God warns us about that. 2 Peter 3, 15 through 17, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. So again, it talks about distorting scripture to their own destruction and other, numerous other warnings in the Bible against distorting scripture and warning uh, us to stand firm against people or against teachings that do distort scripture. Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. So again, no matter how good uh, we think our motives are, no matter uh, how much we think it, it, you know, we really should stray from a straightforward reading of the Bible, uh, that may seem right to us, but it, in, its end is the way of death. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, to me this is a comforting verse uh, because you wonder, well, is this the first time Christians have ever been tempted? Is this the first time there's ever been a false religion that just so dominates a society uh, that it's very hard to resist? Well, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 uh, tells us, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man, and God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. So it's telling us that you know, this temptation is not new. And people have been able to endure these types of temptations in the past. And again, if we, uh, uh, God will provide a way of escape. And so uh, no matter how strong the temptation is to compromise with a false religion or accommodate to false religion, uh, God will allow us to resist that. And he's also given us numerous Old Testament uh, teachings on false religion. Uh, Romans 15, 4 talks about the Old Testament, says, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for your, our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. And so... Uh, we know if we go back to the Old Testament, we can also find uh, examples uh, related, again, to, to <clears throat> many topics, and certainly this topic as well. I'll give an example uh, related to false religions. I think an excellent example from the Old Testament is found in 1 Kings 18, 17 through 21. Uh, reads, when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is this you, you troubler of Israel? He said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and you have followed the Baals. Now then, send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel, together with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. 
So Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel, brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Now, there's at least six observations that we can make relative to this scripture. Uh, first, uh, first Kings 18, 17, when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is this you, you troubler of Israel? And this is kind of interesting because, of course, Ahab was the king who was uh, leading the people astray, allowing the people to go astray, and Elijah was God's prophet. But Ahab is accusing Elijah of being the troubler of Israel. Uh, what's applicable about this is in many t cases, uh, Christians are viewed the same way today. In, uh, in this particular area related to evolution, a lot of times atheists will try to, uh, they'll protest uh, Christians being appointed to high scientific positions. They will uh, protest uh, Christians having uh, any influence uh, related to science. Many uh, atheistic professors will uh, strongly discourage biblical creationists from being in their department, uh, to ridiculing to the point of even making it very hard for them to get degrees. And so uh, in this case, even though the atheists are wrong and it's very uh, straightforward to demonstrate that they're wrong, uh, society as a whole, in particular those individuals, they'll actually view Christians more as troublers than uh, people that really have the, the only true hope for our society. And so, uh, interesting observation. We struggle with it today, but uh, it was struggled with 3,000 years ago as well. Um, second observation, uh, coming from 1 Kings 18, 19, says, Now then, send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel, together with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. Uh, observation here is that Baal worshippers were not dumb, they were just deceived. Many of the most important people in Elijah's society worshipped Baal. The uh, same is true today. Uh, we see uh, many evolutionists are very intelligent, they're very educated, and they've just been deceived. And a lot of times, uh, if a person is not willing to put the few minutes of serious thought into the issue, uh, that's required for them to really start doubting evolution, start doubting where they put their faith, uh, they can go through their entire life deceived. And that does not mean that they're uh, not intelligent, they're not educated. Again, they are just uh, deceived in this particular area. Uh, what's also uh, uh, interesting here is, again, the uh, level to which the deception has occurred where you now have almost everyone that could be viewed as important or educated or probably viewed as intelligent uh, enough to be eating with the queen, uh, eating at Jezebel's table, uh, they also believed in this false religion. They believed in Baal. And so when we, uh, we see studies and we say, well, this Academy of Sciences or that Academy of Sciences, 80% uh, of the members are evolutionists or don't believe in God or whatever, whatever the number might be, uh, I have to realize that that's a very skewed statistic because many of those organizations, to actually be allowed to be a member of those organizations, a uh, person either has to be known to be an atheist or an evolutionist, or at the very least could not have been a vocal uh, Christian or a vocal uh, biblical creationist. And so uh, uh, kind of a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy uh, happens now and also happened uh, back in, in Elijah's society. Uh, another observation that can be made from 1 Kings 18, 19, uh, quite possible that some individuals profess faith in Baal simply to improve their physical lives or avoid persecution. Same observation holds true for many professed evolutionists and atheists today. A lot of uh, evolutionists and atheists will uh, kind of quietly whisper, a lot of people that uh, we might think are evolutionists or atheists, when we get in a discussion with them, they'll kind of quietly say, well, you know, they've never really believed that, and uh, they always knew there was something more than that. Uh, and the point is, though, is that uh, they are very nervous, and in many reasons, rightfully so, about uh, being really uh, open, you know, really uh, discussing the fact that they don't believe evolution or atheism, and that's because of the, the uh, ramifications that would have on their careers, on their jobs, on their physical lives. And so that's, uh, again, something that occurred 3,000 years ago, occurs still today. John 12, 42 through 43, nevertheless, many of even the rulers believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Another observation, uh, same verse from 1 Kings 18, 19, uh, pride would have provided a strong temptation to promote Baal worship. Same observation holds true for evolutionists and atheists today. A lot, a lot of times we'll read these books uh, or hear about these books, and some of them become bestsellers, and they have these really pretentious uh, titles. I heard, you know, one was talking about the God particle, I think, uh, other, uh, other books. And the, the whole idea is uh, a lot of times 
evolutionists or atheists, they will claim that they're going to try to provide the answers that God has already given us in the Bible. And uh, later in the series, we'll, we'll uh, give some examples of, of that, you know, again, having occurred over past uh, centuries. Uh, but they will really uh, pretend like these questions have not been answered, even though God's already given us the answers in the Bible. And they'll say that they're the ones that are going to uh, somehow going to solve these problems. And so it's everything uh, in this particular area. You know, they talk about, uh, you know, I'm going to determine where the universe came from or how life arose or how, well, you know, God already told us that. But again, it's uh, a certain amount of pride to, uh, and uh, excitement to f if someone feels that they're working in the field that's going to really answer these fundamental questions, these questions about how did we get here or why are we here. And that uh, uh, seems to be a motivator for a lot of uh, atheists and evolutionists. It's just the, uh, again, the pride associated with feeling that they're uh, yeah, working in this area uh, to provide these very fundamental answers. But again, of course, as Christians, we know God has already uh, provided that in the Bible. Uh, Romans 1.22, very applicable here, professing to be wise, they became fools. Uh, fifth observation, uh, this is a uh, uh, really different verse, 1 Kings 18.21, to read it again, it says, Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. And so the fifth observation here is that, uh, again, many Israelites did not believe in Baal. And, and so, but they also, because of the prevalence of Baal worship, because of the prevalence of this false religion, um, they also were afraid to speak up for God. And so he had this uh, dilemma. And, and sure enough, if you uh, uh, take a look at a lot of surveys, you usually find that uh, less than 10% or maybe 10% or so of people really truly believe in evolution. Uh, but a vast majority of people, they don't believe in evolution, but the, just the prevalence of that false religion in our society, the degree to which it's talked about, everything from children's shows to museums to popular magazines claiming to be scientific to you know, TV shows, everything, uh, promoting this false religion also makes them a little shy, a little more timid about uh, taking a, a stand for God. And so that's uh, uh, perhaps the the biggest damage that this particular religion is doing is, is discouraging people, again, to be willing to, to really take a stand to God, to really say that they believe in God. Uh, Matthew 5, 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Uh, finally, a last observation, uh, going up to 1 Kings 18, uh, now we're in verse uh, 38 through 39. It says, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. So the sixth observation is, you know, God gave the Israelites tremendous evidence. And when he gave them that tremendous evidence, that uh, that strengthened their faith. Well, likewise, in this area, God has given us tremendous evidence. And so uh, by pointing out the evidence of God's creation, by pointing out the absurdity of evolution, just based on what we know scientifically, uh, that is a way, again, to help uh, uh, bring people to God or bring people back to God. Romans 1.20, for since the creation of the world has invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Another observation uh, related to false religions, uh, and we'll be talking about this a lot in the, uh, throughout the series, uh, a lot of times false religions are construed such that no matter what the observation uh, is, it can be claimed to be support for that religion. So we see that, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, witch doctor. If things are going well, it's because you paid the witch doctor. If uh, uh, things are going bad, it's because you didn't pay the witch doctor enough. And so it always comes back to uh, uh, putting faith in the witch doctor. When we look at what how evolution is construed, how that theory is construed, we also find that it's construed in a way that anything could be twisted or viewed somehow as support for evolution. It's kind of interesting because that in itself makes it a non-scientific theory. A scientific theory has to be possible to devise an experiment and where that experiment would actually show uh, the theory to be false. And evolutionists have tried very hard to make sure that such experiments couldn't be devised. We Again, talking about spontaneous generation, uh, to any any person willing to th objectively think about the subject will know that spontaneous generation does not occur. And again, we'll get into the details later in the series. Uh, but uh, it's still, uh, evolutionists have been very careful to make sure that there's not an experiment that could just completely show their, their particular belief system to be false. And so again, it's uh, construed in such a way, it's construed just the way it's construed is, is to be a religious belief, not a scientific theory.
Now, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the religious beliefs related to origins that, that various great individuals have had. And this, I think this is an important table. I know it's uh, kind of small print, but the idea is to just communicate that, you know, again, this is not a, a, a scientific question. There are brilliant individuals that, that really fall into all areas, and it's really a choice, again, of where these individuals have chosen to put their faith. Uh, look at individuals that believe the Bible, again, is given in Genesis. Had uh, Sir Francis Bacon established the scientific method. Uh, again, probably the founder of modern science. Isaac Newton uh, worked in cal calculus, laws of motion, gravity, reflecting telescope, optics. Carl Linnaeus, botanist, taxonomic classification. Louis Pasteur, father of microbiology. Again, all of these individuals, Bible believers, believing in God's word. James Maxwell developed fundamental equations of light and electromagnetic radiation. Werner von Braun, who developed the uh, Saturn V rocket that allowed us to go to the moon. Raymond Domitian, the MRI scanner. Russ Humphreys, a lot of work with related to magnetic fields. John Baumgartner, internationally known geophysicist and others, all putting their faith in the Bible. But there's also been some great uh, individuals that hold other beliefs. Uh, intelligent design, I uh, talk about uh, Francis Crick. He was the co-discoverer of DNA. Uh, he believed in intelligent design, meaning he knew uh, from his work with DNA that it, it could have just happened randomly. And so uh, he knew there was design there. But again, to uh, anyone's, to the best of people's knowledge, he's not become a Christian. He's not a, uh, uh, his uh, realization that evolution was false uh, did not lead him to become a Christian. And that's, uh, that's a very important point because, as we'll also talk about later on, just convincing a person not to believe in evolution isn't enough. We really need to take them all the way to becoming Christians. Uh, Sir Frederick Hoyle, a uh, famous British astronomer, he actually coined the term Big Bang. Uh, he also rejected evolution. He realized that it was a uh, false theory that it was, again, scientifically absurd. But again, to the, the best of uh, everyone's knowledge, he never became a Christian. And there's other, uh, again, very intelligent, very educated individuals that fall into this intelligent design area. And there's also intelligent, uh, educated evolutionists. Uh, Charles Darwin, of course, the, the most uh, uh, well-known, he really uh, uh, popularized the theory starting in the mid-1800s. Uh, but again, uh, uh, certainly an intelligent individual. And you also have uh, Ernst Haeckel, uh, did a, a great deal, um, a lot of effort promoting evolution uh, on the continent of, of Europe, uh, you know, trying to uh, you know, push that belief system in Germany and elsewhere, and uh, other individuals as well. Again, uh, intelligent individuals in all areas of this debate. And so again, just to recognize that a person's, uh, many of the greatest scientists uh, have had different views of, on this particular issue. A lot of great Scientists were staunch Bible believers, but there's also been great scientists that uh, believed in intelligent design, kind of a um, kind of a nebulous designer or a neb you know kind of a fuzzy god, not necessarily the god of the Bible. And then you also a lot of great scientists that have, have put their faith in evolution. Um, so before we uh, proceed further, I think it's important to define terms. And so when we're talking about biblical creationism, uh, we're really talking about the first two chapters of Genesis and the widely accepted implications from a straightforward reading of those two chapters. Uh, God created all kinds of life about 6,000 years ago. Then each original kind contained a tremendous amount of genetic information. And so again, the, the genetic information, the information in our DNA that gives us our physical characteristics, or the information in the DNA of life that, that gives life its physical characteristics, all that information was in the original created kinds. Prior to the fall of man, all life was genetically perfect as created by God. But then since the fall, God's creation, which includes DNA and all forms of life, has been in decay. And so in other words, we're seeing mutations. We're seeing a kind of a degradation of the DNA of the original genetic information that God put in life. What we call species today are the result of natural selection operating on the original created kinds. Genetic mutations, which are neutral or result in a loss of genetic information, have also occurred. And so when we talk about species today, again, the information needed to create the physical characteristics of the species, that was in the original created kind. But when Adam sinned, when death entered the world, uh, you also had natural selection begin to operate. And that natural selection has resulted in the, in the different species that we see. So that's uh, biblical creationism and, and the widely accepted implications. Uh, evolution uh, actually predates Christianity. It was first proposed over 2,500 years ago. Uh, sixth century BC, Greek philosopher Anaximander argued that life arose from mud exposed to sunlight, and that subsequently evolved into man. And what's really interesting is, you know, again, that was over 2,500 years ago. That's remarkably similar to, to the same theory that, that uh, Darwin um, promoted. And so, again, uh, if you think about it, if God, if a person chooses to believe that God did not create 
the universe. God did not create life. God did not create man. There's really not too many other options. And so the option that, well, it must have just made itself uh, obviously comes up. And that, again, there's a uh, earliest uh, recorded example of that was about 2,500 years ago. In the Middle Ages, a lot of people had kind of believed some of the implications. One of them was the spontaneous generation of life. Uh, they would believe things like uh, if you wanted to spontaneously generate maggots, you'd leave some meat out on the counter. And because maggots would appear in the meat, that obviously meant that the, meats were, the maggots were spontaneously generating out of the meat. So they thought they had even some scientific observations related to that. Again, uh, if you want maggots, you leave meat out and uh, give it a few days and there will be maggots. Uh, same thing if you wanted fruit flies, you could let some flu fruit rot. If you wanted uh, rats, uh, just leave some trash out back and uh, pretty soon there'll be rats there. And so they believed, uh, widespread belief that, that those uh, animals would be spontaneously arising. Uh, again, just based on their observations and really without properly applying any science. Again, really the scientific method hadn't uh, really even been developed at that point. Uh, now in uh, 1859 to 1861, Louis Pasteur, uh, again the father of modern microbiology, he, he, he knew this was false, uh, but he set out to devise a set of experiments to try to prove it was false. And so uh, he performed experiments to show that spontaneous generation does not happen. What he would do is he would take some broth and boil it to sterilize it, and then some of the broth he would seal uh, to keep it isolated from the air, and other uh, parts of the broth he would uh, leave open to the air. And he showed that the broth that was sealed from the air, it was in a flask, sealed from the air, uh, nothing grew in it. You know, it had been sterilized and uh, nothing would grow in that broth, but the broth that was open to the air would have things begin growing in it. And so from that, he, he demonstrated that the life that was supposedly spontaneously generating, being generated in the broth was actually just, uh, you know, microbes being deposited in the broth that were being carried along by the air currents and deposited in the broth. Now, now the timing on this is really interesting. Again, this was occurring 1859 to 1861. Right at the same time, 1859, Darwin really starts to uh, kind of repopularize the theory of evolution, argued that life spontaneously arose in some warm little pond as a result of sunlight acting on various organic salts. And so at the same time Louis Pasteur is showing that spontaneous generation doesn't occur, Darwin is trying to claim that it does occur. And what's interesting on the timing is he actually got a lot of support because even though uh, Pasteur's experiments were performed, there's a lot of uh, uh, resistance or skepticism, not really skepticism, but just a lot of people that kept claiming, well, no, I can make, uh, I can make life anytime I want to. A famous example uh, from 1858 to 1876, uh, Felix Archimedes Pouchet, uh, director of a natural history museum in France, a very uh, influential individual, and he claimed that he could make uh, spontaneous generation, he could make life anytime he wanted to. Uh, again, just uh, uh, using, uh, you know, made these claims in front of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, all kinds of academies of sciences, uh, the Paris Academy of Sciences, uh, other places. Uh, and it took literally until 1876 before Louis Pasteur and Charles Chamberlain were able to show the errors in his experiment. And so during that time, uh, theory of evolution, the idea that spontaneous generation could actually happen, it really gained a toehold. It really started to gain a lot of momentum. And we'll, again, talk in uh, 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 future classes about some of the efforts to really to help build on that momentum, help sustain that momentum. So what we have now is the uh, Neurodarwinian synthesis, uh, popularized today. Universe spontaneously formed 13.7 billion years ago. Solar system formed 4.5 billion years ago. Living organisms spontaneously arose. Again, somehow they just uh, uh, spontaneously arose from non-living chemicals. Mutations in DNA are sometimes beneficial. Such mutations are passed to the next generation, increasing the fitness of an organism's offspring. Beneficial mutations will increase the likelihood that an organism will live to reproductive maturity. Over time, beneficial mutations result in new species. And that's a, uh, a fair summary of what uh, uh, evolutionists believe in the 21st century. Want to uh, end with a couple of analogies. Um, we talk about life from non-life. An analogy would be creationists believe that complex machines, uh, computers, cars, space shuttles are designed and built by an intelligent creator. Uh, in the case of uh, uh, you know, computers, cars, and space shuttles, that's people that have, have created them. And of course, in the case of life, that was God. Uh, Neo-Darwinian synthesis would have to say that complex machines, computers, cars, space shuttles assemble and operate themselves via random chemical interactions because again, uh, those machines are trivial compared to the simplest life and evolutionists will, will claim or will believe that somehow simple life just assembled itself, just spontaneously arose. So that's an analogy for life from non-life. Uh, we look at uh, diversity of life, uh, creation would be given a complete encyclopedia, write a sentence about butterflies. In other words, given this tremendous amount of genetic information that God put in the original created kinds, uh, somehow derive or derive or have uh, developed the species that we see today, working with that original uh, information. And so 
That's the uh, uh, creation analogy. Uh, the neo-Darwinian synthesis analogy would be given a sentence about butterflies, write a complete encyclopedia. So in other words, starting with a very little amount of information, uh, starting about with just the information that was contained, saying that whatever they would postulate would be the first simple life, uh, somehow take that information and convert that into all of the genetic information necessary for all the physical characteristics uh, that we see in all of the animals around us. So again, uh, two analogies, I think they're useful, again, for putting the, the problem in context. And again, we'll be uh, talking a lot more detail in the sessions to follow. This has been a presentation of Apologetics Press, an organization dedicated to the defense of New Testament Christianity. Visit us on the web at apologeticspress.org or call 800-234-8558.